afford to be here. This is small town music. This is big town music. He's ahead of his time, you know, but he can't use it. If only he could prove it. Well, tomorrow's just a song away. A song away. A song away. Hey everybody, welcome to Rock Solid, the comedy podcast for all things music, both new and classic. I'm Pat Francis, and joining me today uh, is the legendary lead singer of the rock band Yes. His voice defines a genre of, of rock and roll. He's got a new album out right now called 1000 Hands Chapter One. Please welcome John Anderson. How you doing, John? Hey! Hey! <laughs> Hey John, first, where, where where are you right now? Where are you quarantining, John? Where are we talking to you from? I live here with my beautiful wife Jane. We've been here twenty years in Central California, just away the village of Arroyo Grande, up in the hills. Okay. And uh, the topography is just like Accrington, where I was born. Excellent. But the weather's really much better. The weather's <laughs> better. Uh, I'm also I'm in Southern California, and yeah, you can't beat the weather. No, no, it's wonderful. As long as the ground does, as long as the ground doesn't shake, we're good. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, John, we uh, th- this is incredible. You've been recording music for over fifty years. When you hear that, Bizarre. yeah, when you hear that number, what do you, does it feel like? Fifty years, or does it feel like five? Well, yesterday um, I was asked to write something, so I, I wrote down that I just watched uh, Monty Python. The nearly the truth. It's this uh, incredible uh, show on TV on Netflix, and uh, and I wrote yes. I used to actually have fish and chips with a couple of the guys from Monty <laughs> Python in a fish and chip shop fifty years ago. And my head went <laughs> fifty years ago. I can't can't believe it. Time just flies. It's crazy. Yeah, um, yeah, having fun. Time flies. <laughs> so, uh, John, you got 16 studio albums with Yes. You got 15 solo albums and you have countless collaboration albums. It's how did 1000 Hands come to be? Well, the initiation of it was uh, a friend of mine who was in my first band, uh, Brian Chatton. He was the keyboard player in the Warriors in the 60s. And uh He'd been on tour with uh, B.B. King and other people like that. I bumped into him in L.A. in 1990, and I was just heading up to Big Bear to do some recording. And I asked him to write some music for it, and he sent me a cassette of him playing keyboards and uh, with a groove and everything. And I wrote these songs on his music, and I had some musicians come in and work with me on producing it. And uh, Brian came up, and uh, it just happened from there that the idea of the 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 idea of making an album was not really what I was going to do. I just thought we'll write some music, and uh, I, I was able to take a couple of tracks to LA. And Chris Squire was there with Alan White doing another project, so I got them to play on the tracks, and uh, it all started to sound really good. And I thought I'd love to get more people involved, and uh, as it happened. Uh, I went down to NAM, which is a music a musical instruments convention in, in Anaheim. Sure. And uh, I was up there actually with a guy on this strange, beautiful uh, keyboard. And we were doing a song or two together in front of 12 people. <laughs> and I, I started singing Help Me Rhonda. And there was Bruce Johnson from the Beach Boys kind of freaked me out. And we said <laughs> hi. And I thought I could, if I could get the Beach Boys to sing on this album... It didn't mean what I'm trying to do is get more different people, musicians to, to perform on it. But it didn't, it finally didn't happen, uh, the project. So I put the tapes in my garage for 28 years, thinking, well, I was always on tour with Yes, I was right. making albums and doing other things. And just generally, what do you do? You just uh, let go of things. I always thought they were going to be okay, good songs one day. And then uh, this producer, Michael Franklin, got in touch with me and said, uh, I get the tapes and send them to him. These are big 24 track <laughs> tapes. And he put them in an oven, baked them, and then they can play just once, actually. And then you go straight to computer. 
And he sent me a mix of everything and it sounded really good. And he asked me, you know, if you know any musicians that want to play on it, please just do it. You know, I love Billy Cobham. He said, oh, I know him. And Michael Franklin and his brother Tim worked with uh, Chuck Berry for 10 years or so. So they knew so many musicians. And he obviously did a lot of albums in his studio there in Orlando. And uh, got Ian Anderson to play on a track. And then he he got Chick Corea to play on a track. The, the you know Tower of Power came in and played on <laughs> and so on and so on. And he never stopped for a year. He just kept bringing in people to play on it. So it blossomed. And I, I just wrote uh, three or four new songs, basically the album. Yeah, and some of the people that are on this include Steve Howe, Bobby Kimball, Charlie DeChant, Robbie Steinhardt, Rick Derringer, Jonathan Cain, <laughs> Jean-Luc Ponte. Hey. I mean, and I was wondering, that was going to be one of my questions, how long this has been in the making, because uh, sadly Chris Squire is no longer with us, but he's, he's on tracks on the album. So, and, and you're telling me that this dates back 20 years? Some no, of these 30 songs? 30 years. 30 years. Well, yeah. Two thirds of the songs are from 30 years ago, and another third were the new songs that I did three or four years ago. I did some, I call it vocalizationing, <laughs> which is my, my, my own word. I should uh, register. Yeah, it. copyright that. Um, yeah. And it's just me uh, mimicking what the pygmies do in, in Western Africa. I saw this uh, video one time some 40 years ago of uh, the pygmies going out hunting and foraging and, and they're singing along with the insects and the birds. It's unbelievable. That's what they do all day long. They're beeping, bopping, beeping, bopping, beep. That's one guy. Another guy going, do what? Do, do what? Do, do. It's like... Uh, it's like the doo-wop sort of thing <laughs> from the 50s. So I sent Michael Franklin a couple of these tracks, which turned out to be Rama Lama and Where Does Music Come From? And uh, lo and behold, uh, Michael loved them so much, he actually recorded the music for Where Does Music Come From on a plane to China, which he does quite a lot because his wife's Chinese. So he was using the computer and all the computer sounds to create the music for uh, Where Does Music Come From. It's just uh, that's the way things are these days. You can make music in a coat pocket, you know. <laughs> yeah, there's no baking tapes anymore. It's it's no, it's all no, digital. No, no. But so yeah, you're, true. so the vocal takes on this album are those also 30 years old, or did you you re-recorded some of the vocals? Unbelievable. We kept the original vocals. Uh, maybe there's a couple of words here in uh, "Activate Me." I wanted to change the words on a couple of things. That was all. My voice sounded the same, which is bizarre. It's crazy, but uh, it's a true, true thing. And uh, of course, what I sing in the new songs, it's the same voice, it's right. the same person. You know, it sounds incredible. It just, it's a, it's a really, really great collection of songs. I see that it's. Uh, called chapter one is there a chapter two somewhere well what we had was uh three songs left over from the original recordings we actually did a in big bear i did a song of john lennon's which was uh nobody told me there'd be days like these which yes. i always love great song and so we're gonna redo it uh this next year we're gonna we've done about five or six songs already for chapter two but it'll probably be work that's done next year sometime for the year after we don't know exactly yet and the title 1000 hands does that come from uh the fact that 500 people were involved with making this record <laughs> yes <laughs> <laughs> yes or you know um w when the the internet started i got really into that i have uh, facebook and uh i started uh, writing down all the people that have influenced me over the years this is about 10 years ago uh -huh. and i finished up with a couple of hundred people and i posted them on my facebook and told people you should do that because it, it gives you a good reflection of your life and uh so when uh, michael franklin said originally it was going to be called us lot 
which is a North Country English saying a lot of us. U Z L O T. Okay. Us lot. A lot of us. And uh, he said, why don't we call it 1,000 hands? And uh, I said, okay. Why not? <laughs> why not? At this at this point in your career, you're you're easy going. You're like, sure, if that's a good idea, you'll you'll go with it. No, <laughs> <laughs> I have cha- I I haven't changed my perception of what I'm doing for 50 years. I'm very eager and excited to do adventurous music, and uh, I remember I did this album with this and uh, Alan and Trevor Rabin. They were called Cinema, uh, but we did this album. And uh, they wanted to call the album some obscure title. And I just said, they, were, they, they went to talking about it for about two hours. Uh-huh. Said, what are we going to call the album? And I said, what is the, <clears throat> we finished the album. I said, what is the number of the album in, in the index? And it was, um, I think it was nine nine one eight three two or something like that. And I said, well, let's do that. But then the, the record wasn't printed until it became 90125. Which was uh, the comeback for you to the band, and it yeah. was it was gigantic. How much do you yeah. think um, MTV played in that? Because before that, you, there weren't really yes videos, but then all of a sudden, here's Owner of a Lonely Heart. Yeah, it was, uh, we, we came in exactly the correct time to do a video, which was okay video, but the record sounded so good, and that was uh, the work of uh, Trevor Horn more than anybody, because he'd already done uh, a couple of albums I love. One was uh, Duck Rock, which was uh, done by the manager of the Sex Pistols, mm-hmm. Malcolm McLaren, and that was an amazing production. And as soon as I heard this, uh, and Chris told me, he said we've got you know Trevor Horn doing doing the uh, production. I said. Well, he's good because he's very advanced Mm -hmm. technically and sonically and everything. And then I just joined in and started working on the lyrics for the and and the melody for the verses of Owner. The chorus was already a hit, so me and Trevor worked out the verses. Me and Trevor Horn, and then I worked on uh, One Hearts for Love, Two Hearts. You know, choruses were needed in some of the music. I I felt a very good part of it, but it it was just, uh, for me, it was a fantastic uh, period of time for that next three years being number one around the world. It it was just a monster. Mega famous. Yes. And it's it's all a big illusion. (laughs) It's funny because I've told this story many times. Just before we started, I went to see Spinal Tap and that just... Changed my whole perception of what we were. <laughs> it was it was great. It was great. Here's a question I I've, I had uh, for you concerning Trevor Horn. Now this is the guy who replaced you when you left the band. Yeah. He replaced you as vocalist. So now yeah. I always thought that was fascinating that you had no animosity towards him and you guys were able to work together to create a, a great collection of music. Yeah, because by then I got over the. The feeling that, uh, as I said at that time, when I heard that they were putting in uh, these couple of guys that were pop stars into the band, I said, that's the manager. He would put Mickey Mouse on the stage. He he doesn't care. (laughs) And and they didn't tell the audience. So it didn't, the tour didn't go very well because. Yeah. <clears throat> and because it wasn't very well, you know, but a lot of money was made by the mm-hmm. managers. And because it's very difficult to sing the Yes catalog live, you might be able to record some new songs in the studio and yeah. get through it. And and I and I yeah. do I do like the album they made, but I, I mean I yeah. I have heard that uh, yeah that tour did did not work out for whatever no. reasons. It, and, and like to be to sing Yes songs, uh, I'd been doing it for ten years, so I I was well trained sure. to do it. I I knew exactly how to the breathing mm-hmm. technique and not overdoing the drugs and th- stuff like that because you just got to take care of yourself. 
So that's why I can sing like I do, because I really took care of myself uh, in the 70s and 80s, because it's easy to go out there and just be a rock star. Right. You know. Um, yeah. See, that's the thing. Like, if I go to if I go to a concert and the vocalist makes a mistake, I know it. If the, if the bass player or the guitarist or someone else yeah. makes a mistake, I, I, I'm not going to know. But I, but you need to stay on point the whole time. Yeah. And you had, and you've been able to do that for 50 that's, years. That's my gig. Yeah. It's my gig. <laughs> it's almost like a miracle that you're still able to yes. sing this, these songs. It's true. So let's uh, talk. Well, you know, you know, I was very fortunate. Um, it's in my memory. I met doing my memoirs like a lot of people. Mm -hmm. uh, and I remember a time where I met with a higher uh, consciousness uh, being, in Vegas, of all places. And he said that I would still be singing in 21st century. And I said, no, nah, I don't think so. <laughs> you have the best gig, John. Rockstar is your gig. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty sweet. No. Well, you know, I think of myself as a mu musician. Yes. And, and I, I, I started playing the guitar when I was 24, 23, 24, and just strumming away. And then luckily met Chris Squire and listened to my songs and he liked them. And then the next step was meeting with uh, Steve Howe, who we, we joined together at the hip like brothers and wrote some amazing songs together with Chris as well, of course. And uh, so the idea that I evolved at that time in the 70s and started really discovering music and how classical music works and things like that, and indigenous music works, that got very interested in that. And uh, like a lot of people, uh, Peter Gabriel had a whole project of uh, music from around the world uh, on his label. So, so the uh, so the new album you have uh, you released a couple singles from it. You released now, Ramalama. Yeah. When I hear Ramalama, I think of the uh, Ramalama Ding Dong. I think of the old. Oh yeah. <laughs> well, I never thought about that until two weeks ago. Somebody <laughs> pointed it out in an article. I went, "Oh yeah, Ramalama Ding Dong." I used to sing <laughs> that with my first band. <laughs> so that it's that. So I just want people to know that is not uh, you're not doing a cover of that song. <laughs> no, no, no. It's an Indonesian uh, way of explaining the, the 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 mystery of the nature of the planet. Little temples in all the gardens. The temple for the flowers. The temple for the trees. The temple for the stones. For the birds and bees, mm -hmm. you know, kind of thing. I love this. Lovely. Yeah, I love those two songs back to back. They're they're uh, they're a great. Uh, you know, beginning to this album. Yeah. Good stuff. Yeah, thank you. You finally made it into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Ta da Were you were you were you excited about that or did it take so long that by that time you were just like, whatever? Well, there, it was always the case of a manager would say, I'm gonna get you into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. <laughs> I'm gonna do this ten years later. Yeah. Get in so so okay, really. And it's a beautiful thing. And I, I'm I'm very very grateful because me and my wife Jane went to see uh, the Hall of Fame there in uh, Cleveland, and you walk around and you're amongst all your heroes. Yeah. You know, I, I remember it's one of the first gigs that my first band played opened up for uh, Little Richard, um, Bill Haley and the Comets, Gene Vincent, and you know we opened up for that. That was a tour that was on tour, and we opened up for them. Wow, the local. Uh, place in Nelson Imperial. It was a big building. If you walk around the Hall of Fame, you meet, you see all these people and you, that that have created who you are, musically speaking. You know, it's just amazing. And then, and you're right in that club now, which yeah, that's yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah, my uh, that's true. My my sadness with the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame when they make some of my my favorite bands wait so long to get in. Sadly, Chris Squire wasn't with us to enjoy the accolades of that. And he probably would have loved it. Well, he enjoyed it. He was there. He was there in spirit. spirit. Of course. Yeah. So let me ask you about it. Cause you're talking about all these, uh, all these bands that, uh, that meant something to you when you were younger. Uh, the first yes album comes out in 1969 and you guys record a cover of the birds. I see you. I see you. Yeah. W were you, uh, were you fans of music coming out of the U S in the sixties? Yeah, 
I think part and parcel of what happened in 67 was uh, Jimi Hendrix, Sergeant Pepper, Beach Boys, um, Buffalo Springfield, Zappa, <laughs> so much music, you yeah. know. Uh, uh, we incorporated all that in our first uh, sort of, you know, association. We we loved the harmonies of that band and uh, an album we loved. Uh, Jimmy Webb created all these songs for the Fifth Dimension. Yes. So we used to sing uh, Ear Inside My Paper Cup, <laughs> Everything Is Looking Up. We, that was one of the songs we did in our first tour. And uh, it's, it's extraordinary that but that's where we started really copying all these mu- music I got at that time. Yeah. And we, we just we just uh just changed the arrangement. And the, the reason we did that was a band called Vanilla Fudge. Oh yeah. A famous band. They changed the arrangements of big hits and slowed them down. Set me free, why don't you babe slow it down? Yeah. It was unbelievable. It was like and, and things like that. So we just copied what was happening. And then during the course of the first couple of albums, we went on tour with Richie Haven. So I wanted to sing one of his songs for the second album, which was uh, no experience necessary. And uh, it, it evolved from there. I think by the time the third album, we knew who we were. And that's why we had, you know, Starship Trooper and Heart of the Sunrise and things like that for the Fragile album. And, and you know, the build up to the, 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 the real, I think the most uh, important thing that happened with Yes was uh, Close to the Edge. Because we were able to, you know, create music that had never been uh, conceived of uh, from a rock band, you know, and we would tour and play in front of 10, 15,000 people. Right. And they would listen to these long form pieces of music with, then we started doing production and laser beams and things like that. So it, in a way, uh, the survival of the band was because of that, because what was coming through was punk, disco, all these other things. So Yes was never really built to record radio music no. for some reason. You weren't you weren't a singles it, it, band. No, 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 no. Fright, it's a frightening gig to try and write a hit. A hit. It's you know, I did. I personally uh, had had the fear of being a one hit wonder. Yeah. So when they when they would take uh, one of your songs, you know, from you know back in the day, like uh, I've seen all good people or Starship Troop, they would they would they would make these radio edits, which were yeah, which were fine, but they really don't give us. You know, exactly. Yeah. I guess you have to get on the radio in some way, but at the same time, it really, really took away from the overall picture of those epic songs. I've seen all good people turn their heads each day for the queen to use. At the time when we were touring, that's when I started thinking about long form pieces because there was, uh, we'd, we'd actually play at universities and listen to and go and actually go to the radio stations at every university mm-hmm. and they were FM. It was all FM. So they would play Starship Trooper all the way through, sure. Art of the Sunrise. And, you know, there we are. We, we have a place <laughs> for our music. And of course, by the time we finished uh, Close to the Edge, FM closed down around America because there was no money in it. So they all went to, back to AM, which is true. And that was like, oops. <laughs> but we still went, still went out there and performed these long form pieces and the audiences, bless them, uh, stayed with the band. There was something going on, you know. Yeah, I mean, 1971 with the Yes album, that's the big breakthrough. And, and Steve Howe joins the band. How much do you credit Steve Howe with um, helping you guys break through? on that third album or was it going to happen no matter what the whole idea Here was to go away from London and rent a farmhouse down in Devon that Steve still lives in. Actually. Wow. Um, and we went down there for a month and learned about each other and got really close. 
and wrote some really good songs, went on the road performing new songs as well as the other parts of our show, like America and things that people knew, and um, songs from the first two albums. And uh, then when we went in the studio, we were a well-oiled band. That's when I felt uh, we're going to survive. And that's, that led us into... Uh, and Steve was a very important part of my life for four, four years at that time. Yeah. Just, work, just working with somebody who had a sixth sense. And uh, we just wrote things together without thinking. Very quick. You know, very easy to work with. He was very malleable because I, 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 I didn't want to do the usual verse, verse, chorus, verse, verse, right. chorus. I didn't want to, didn't want to go there. I wanted, wanted more. In, um, that's why I was listening a lot to classical music, the stanza they would call it. It would pop in now and again, so I would do that with our songs, and you just learn as you go along about what's been tried and tested before, and make sure it's part of a new presentation and, and people said there is not not much new in this world actually if you listen to you know uh, the marvelous uh, Jacob Collier who's 26 and he writes incredible songs lyrics he does amazing orchestrations this is the future of our music but he learned it all from Stevie Wonder and a lot of people around you can tell by the flavor of his song writing but he had to learn it from somebody yeah. to become who he is exactly so 1971, you guys, you guys dropped two classic albums in one year. Was that, was that record 71? company? Well, I've got 71? the, I've got the, the Yes album and Fragile both came out in 1971. Um, okay. We got February 71 and then November 71 for Fragile. Was that a record? Wow. Were you guys just <laughs> firing on all cylinders or was this the record company saying, Let, let's get another one yeah. out guys? No, no, we we were just hell bent to make music and get off tour, get in the studio, go on tour, go in the studio, go on tour. We did that for ten years. Yeah, that's what we did for ten years. That's the way it was back then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But in just this one year, you guys—I mean, roundabout, long distance runaround. Yours is no disgrace. Yeah. These are songs that are still find their way into the set list all these years yeah. later. Yeah. What song do you think? The, the well, sorry, the sorry. well constructed. Mm -hmm. And they, and they actually work with any kind of an audience. You know, I was I was just on tour last year with a thousand hands band and we were doing Yours Notice Grace. And we were doing uh, Starship Trooper, but we rearranged them very slightly because mm -hmm. I had a saxophone player, the, a, guy, a keyboard player played trombone. So you put them in the bridge in the middle section of of uh, yours not his grace man but we started sounding like a big band you know it was fantastic so they're they're just well put together piece of music that will last like forever if you if you're interested in music they will you know and then when you're on tour you do have to make those little changes sometimes to make it fun for yourself you don't want to you don't want to do too drastic you don't want to do a reggae version of roundabout but um or maybe you do <laughs> oh, you do it. you you have done, done it, it. <laughs> yeah we did a reggae version of uh, Your Move last year. Uh, the first tour. Second tour, I thought, oh, let's, let's... Let's go back to the traditional let's, way. Let's go back to the original. But it was fun. You know, music should be fun. You shouldn't be sort of tied to having to do it exactly like the record. Right. You know? I went through that for like 30 years. So now I'm in a free form sort of situation for the next few years. And I'm very excited by next year to do, uh, I wanted to close the, close to the edge um, because it is a beautiful piece. You want to do that, to that uh, album top to bottom? No, no, just, just the, the, the close to the edge. Just the song. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> With my band, you know, I yes. call it my band. And uh, we toured together and it was fun for two two big tours that we did last year. And uh, it just made me want to work with them for a long time because they're just wonderful people. So that means great mean, musicians. So that means when, when uh, touring and live shows come back, you'll be, it'll be a solo John Anderson tour. ARW uh, is on, is on hold for now. Yeah. That, that was just an experience that we went through okay. and uh, I enjoyed it very much. It didn't fulfill what we planned, Okay, but that's, that's life. You know, you just say, 
okay, I've been there before when you get together to do something, you do something enough to keep you going and then you come off and you think, well, that didn't work out where I was going. Okay. Where I was mentally going. And so move on, you know. Well, I do love the live album you guys released. You guys sounded amazing. Yeah. That was a good show in uh, Manchester in England. So at least uh, we got something from it. I know that, um, you know, there was a, the press or whatever always wants to make a big deal out of. There were two, there were basically two yes bands on tour at the same time. Yeah. And for me, that's, that's great because I can go see this or I can go see that or I can go see both. And, yeah. you know, really you, I usually follow where the singer goes because that's yeah. the voice I know from record. And if I want to see those other musicians who played on those albums, I'll go see the other faction. But uh, I yeah. just think it's, I think it's a win-win for the fans. I don't think it should be a big deal. And who, no. who owns the name Yes anyway? It's funny. The actual uh, name is owned by me, Alan, and Chris. Okay. <laughs> I can't remember why. So but that's who owns the name. Uh, the logo is owned by Roger Dean mm -hmm. and so on and so on. And, you know, yes, music is being played. Absolutely. By who. Absolutely. The sad thing would you know, be if, years. yeah, the sad thing would be if yes, music wasn't being played live. I agree. Yeah, I agree. Uh, in 72, you guys do a cover of Simon and Garfunkel's America, which I think is fantastic. Yeah. Let us be lovers. We'd done a show in Wales, and the opening act was a band, I can't remember what they were called, uh, but they did America, like the record, mm -hmm. and it, oh, it sounded so good. And I said to Chris, why don't we do a version? And we got together to talk about it, and in comes Peter Banks, and he starts playing uh, the, the music from uh, West Side Story. And that went like that, fitted together. <laughs> and... Somebody mentioned the other day that Keith Emerson would do uh, America on incredible version of incredible with his band called Nice <laughs> way back in the uh, in so the it was always it, it, sorry it was always a good song so it, well, it is it's a classic and you guys did a, a great job in the in the early days of Yes were you uh. Were you on any uh, bill? Who, who did you tour with? What was a weird bill? Yes. And what were some of the ones oh, you can the, remember? Well, there was a couple, but the best one, every, every time we toured with somebody, something happened wonderful. We, we actually toured our first tour with Yes and other bands was The Who, Small Faces with Rod Stewart, Joe Cocker, Arthur Brown, and Yes. <laughs> that is unbelievable. <laughs> And the, Is that amazing? And the ticket was probably $3. Yeah, like that. <laughs> and I always remember because, you know, I worked bar near the Marquee Club in London and Pete, Peter, Pete Townsend would come in a lot because they played at the Marquee quite a bit. And big stars would come into this bar, you know, Keith Emerson, uh, gosh, Jimi Hendrix came in one time. And, you know, all these people, I would never go up and say, hey, how you doing? You know, <laughs> I, was, I was always kind of very, uh, not shy, I suppose, but, you know, they're stars. I don't want to bug them. And uh, so all the way through the tour, Pete Townsend was sort of, hi, on the second gig. Hi, I <laughs> hey, Pete. He just waved at me. Well, how far into, your, I, I, how far into your career, John, do you start to feel like you are peers with these people? No, no takes a while. Uh, but in fact, you never get to that point, to be very honest. Uh, to, so the last gig we're doing, and Pete Townsend comes over to me and says, you know, you've got a good band, lad. Very good band. Um, good band. And I'd stand there. Think, I, I don't know what to say to Pete Townsend, you know. <laughs> My generation, you know, come on. And he said, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm doing an album about uh, Blind Duncan. And it's like, uh, it's going to be amazing. And I said, Pete Townsend's talking to me. <laughs> I can't believe this. <laughs> He's... And he, obviously, Tom, Tommy came out. It was like a revolution, musically speaking. And the artwork and everything was like... <laughs> <laughs> well, he, he obviously felt you were a peer because he's telling you about a project he's yeah. working on. So, No, he, 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 you know, he just wanted somebody to talk to, I think. <laughs> 
Yeah, I, I can tell I you, know. you're a very humble gentleman. And that's, 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 well, that's a good thing. Yeah. You know, there's more things going on than music. Well, that's true. <laughs> there's a lot of stuff going on. Are you a, are you a citizen? Are you, do you have dual citizenship? Are you a citizen yeah, of yeah. the U.S.? Yeah, I became American 10 years ago. Very, very important because I live here. And, uh, you know, as I said the other day, you know, this is a wild and crazy child in yeah. America. And it's got to grow up and ask for forgiveness, first of all, for the genocide of the Native Americans. And, of course, for what we're going through now, Black Lives Matter and all that. It's, it's, it's an important opportunity to grow for everybody in in the world but especially america yeah i mean a lot a lot of a lot of countries follow america so yeah i mean it's it's 2020 you would you would think we would be way 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 past all this yeah i know it's uh you know it's been brewing believe me it's been brewing for a long time and uh it's a rebirth and uh the conversation is got to be wide open. You just can't stick to one discipline. You know, it's got to be a wide discipline of understanding that we're all here together on this planet as one. And for the first time in the history of human experience, we're all connected yes. via the internet, which yes. is kind of cool. You know, and I'm so thankful for musicians uh, like yourself who are releasing new music now while we're in quarantine. Yeah. I mean, we, we need it. It makes us feel good. And you don't have to leave the house to access new music. You can, again, through the internet, you can, you can purchase it. Very true. Very true. And, uh, yeah. Very, you know, I always think we're in, we're in that sort of leveling off situation where the business is very much like the beginning of the 60s where record companies take care of a dozen people because they're the money makers. Right. And the, the rest are all like, oh, just keep them over. Uh, yeah, we well, could be good. She could be good. You know, bring them in. And that's when the Beatles happened. <laughs> <laughs> and that's and to me, as it happens in my mind, that's when Jacob Collier happened. He is, like to me, the kingpin of what a lot of musicians are doing at the moment. A lot of musicians are out there struggling to be making really, really interesting new style music, mm -hmm. which has got very little to do with the radio, very little to do with being a pop star, if you like. There's nothing wrong in that, no. to be honest. But there's this growth in, you know, I point to uh, to um, Jacob because uh, his orchestrations are unbelievable. His, his, his use of, of melody and you know, if you if you actually watch his work when he's singing with an orchestra, it's remarkable that this this he's only he's so young, you know. So what what some somebody wrote to, you know when people comments at the bottom of the screen when they're watching the guy and it, one was perfect. He said, "Welcome back, Mozart." <laughs> well, here's it's, I I took some questions from some of our listeners, and I have one here. And uh, you, you might have already answered it, but I'll ask it. Uh, this comes from Josh Fitzgerald from Buffalo, New York. He wants to know, are there any contemporary artists that have uh, influenced your solo work? Well, like I say, Jacob Collier right. um, and the, peop the people that he works with, there's about two or three bands that I can't remember names of, sort of a big jazz band, young. I should write, I should write these things down. <laughs> there's so much to remember these but days, John. Yeah, but there, there, there's a lot of, you know, you go to YouTube and all of a sudden you're watching this girl play bass guitar and sing and you think, oh my God. Yeah, she's amazing. Unbelievable. Yeah. What the hell? They're all over the place. Yeah. They're fantastic. It's a great time. It is a great time. And yet it's, uh, it's hard to imagine that new artists will be able to have uh, a financial career the way that some of our veteran artists did. You know, you know what I'm saying? Like you guys came along yeah. and you have longevity for 50 years and it's uh it's a, yeah. a different ball game that way i mean certainly you can get your music out there in a snap yeah. to millions but um but if you want to make uh make a career and make money from music it's a little more difficult don't you think well it was never easy no i mean we we had 90125 and then trying to make a, a follow-up to that was a, a not a total disaster but it was hard because you know, the influences that come into a band from a record company or a manager mm -hmm. just poison the band. It happened three or four times in my career where just leave us alone and let us be who we are. No, you've got to make another 90125. I said that 
I can't even imagine what it would be. <laughs> so so the, the, the crazy thing was Trevor Horn was in charge and he decided that I should stay away from initial initial rehearsals. For Big Generator. Like, yeah. Okay. Like 90125, they, they did all the music for the album and I came in at the end and sort of polished it up a little bit here and there and I did some of me and I know that. And he wanted to do that. So I said, do you want to do that? You know, now that we're a band on the road, we got to know each other again. And yeah. Yeah, that, this is the way we want to do it. I said, okay. So they went to a castle in Italy and uh, I, I made an album with Vangelis. I started making another album, Christmas album and things like that. I actually did an album. Um, a record company got in touch with me and said, uh, we'd like to sign you up to make a record I will give you <laughs> 300 grand, you know, a nice, because, you know, this is in the middle of the 80s. Yeah. I was big, big star. And what are you going to do? do? I said, well, I'm going to go to Cuba and sing with a big band because <laughs> I love the Cuban bands. I really do. And so they stopped the check. <laughs> All right. Okay. <laughs> and said, well, if we're going to pay this money, we'd rather you go to L.A. and maybe work with a producer. We know this producer guy. Uh, he's just done a really good album with Simply Red. And uh, so I got in touch with the, compu the producer, a lovely guy. I've forgotten his name at the moment, but it was in 85, 86. Are you talking about the album called In the City of Angels? Yeah. So he, he said, look, I know this band Toto would love to be your session band. Yes. Most of them were session musicians. So I just loved that. So, you know, for about six months, I was going to be a, a rock pop star. And then all of a sudden, it's, it's, life is funny. Because <laughs> I was actually writing songs with Lamont Dozier. Yes, you wrote with Lamont Dozier and, and you wrote yeah. with David Page from Toto too. It's That was incredible. Yeah. This, one Not of the songs, Dozier, Do, Holland, Dozier, Holland, man. And one of the songs you wrote, uh, "Hold On to Love." It's fantastic. This album's really good, John. This is, you totally leaned into being a pop rock star and it's a really, yeah. really great album. I recommend it to Thank people you. listening. Thank Find you. it. But it never happened. The record company just not didn't get behind it. Mm -hmm. uh, or it wasn't right because Phil Collins came and took over the world. <laughs> he well, did. I, I, I love that album. It's crazy. I love I that album. Too. It's a bit... It was a big hit in Quebec province. <laughs> Isn't that funny when an album, it, when all of a sudden it finds a place somewhere in the world and you don't know why, yeah. but there it is. It's, uh, it's amazing. So it big, amazing. big generator, the overall uh, product, it, it um, wasn't as good as the previous album, but it does have some, it does have some standout tracks. I really love, love will find a way. I mean, I just think it's yeah. excellent sounding. That was going to be the hit record. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was funny because we'd actually done a couple of videos for MTV mm -hmm. that cost like videos cost to make about 150 grand, you know, it costs a lot of money. You'd send them to uh, MTV and to give them the thumbs down. We're, we're not going to play this. I thought, wow, it was a great video, you know, yeah. no, they don't want to play it. And then, so love uh, the next song we were going to try was uh, Love Will Find A Way. And uh, I just said, why are we spending our money on things that people don't want? What's the point? Yeah. I mean, because if MTV was, didn't play it, where was it going to get played? I mean. It wasn't going to get played. No. It was, a real, it was a real problem. But there was more going on that wasn't really good for, for me. So I went, eventually got out of that situation and did ABWH, which I loved very much. That was, that was my get back to yes you know my anderson with bruford, bruford wakeman, wakeman and how 
that is an excellent album. How, what is yeah. it now? Everyone in Yes, I mean, it might seem like you guys are dysfunctional, but you guys keep like interweaving and come back to each other. Yeah. Like Steve Howe was left and, and, and Trevor Rabin came in and Steve Howe had great success yeah. with Asia. And then all yeah. of a sudden yeah. on my album rack, I see, oh, these guys are, <laughs> we got Anderson and Howe are back together again with this, uh, with Bruford and Wakeman. Yeah. And, um, well, I'm, I'm very good at persuade persuasion. <laughs> are you the one that, do you, do you, are you the one that holds the olive branch all the time or do people yeah. come to you? Yeah. Uh, half and half. Mm -hmm. But what, what happened was I got the deal and then I decided to go, uh, to see Steve for a day, two days, Rick for a day in Isle of Man. He lived in Isle of Man. Bill Bruford for a day. And then I'd rented a studio south of say, uh, Paris and got some musicians that could play not the same, but just like uh, Steve and Rick and, and Bill and took them over and re recorded a really good demo of ABWH. And it was a really good demo so that everybody in, you know, Bill, Steve and Rick, and the producer uh, and the record company could understand what I wanted to do. Yeah. And then w we went to Montserrat, which was George Martin's beautiful studio, and we recorded the, the album there in the most beautiful setting, you know, where like cricket with the local school every week. That's life for yeah. me. I, I love that, you know. And then uh, the record company guy said, well, you've done a great job, John, but we'd rather get some professionals in to mix it. And I was ready for mixing it, but then I said, okay, it's your record. <laughs> That's what it was. <laughs> they were paying for it. And uh, so they said they wanted, these two guys out of New York wanted to mix the album in uh, in um, Woodstock at uh, Lee Von Helm studio. Okay. So I got to Woodstock and uh, it was winter, it was January. And uh, I went in the studio and these two guys very sort of smooth operators from New York and they were doing all the tweaking and, and tweaking and doing this and I thought I couldn't do this for six hours a day what am I going to do so I, I rang up the local uh, ski resort in uh, an hour north okay. of uh, Woodstock and so I went skiing every day for, 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 for a month and I'd go there at 10 in the morning set up the songs they were going to do that day and I'd go off skiing all day and come back at five o'clock and listen and go, could you just do it then? <laughs> Perfect. Were you happy with the final mix of uh, yeah. ABWH? Yeah, I loved it. Uh, Steve, not very happy, but uh, you know, he played some great work on it. But yeah. then we went on tour together and we were a damn good band. You know, we, we did a tour of the world as much as you can tour the yeah. world. Well, yeah, you, and, and you have history fantastic. together. So, yeah, you would sound great. Yeah. And, br and brother of mine got some play yeah. on FM. See the desert. We have walked the path. I, I always remember DJ in New Jersey who played it and said, if they'd have called it Long Love, Lost Lover of Mine, it would have been a hit. <laughs> and I thought, you're not wrong. They <laughs> <It> should. <laughs> Because I'd, I'd, I was talking about our Native American brothers and sisters. I, I got into that when, when I was doing a big general event, actually, uh, to East L.A. And, and met with some wonderful people, uh, Lakota um, and people. And uh, I was on a quest, which is another story. And that's why I made an album called Toltec much much later about two years later i was i was rereading carlos castaneda so i got very into making an album about the the the, the mystery of the uh the native americans of uh american mexico and uh, the quest that uh, carlos castaneda was on was unbelievable so they're, they're wonderful books to reread so i can always uh, tell when i read an interview with you or i hear an interview with you that you are a uh, you you're a very well read, uh, intelligent uh, human being. Oh, no. You yeah. you are, and I feel and and you're and you're spiritual, and it just feels like you you're very centered. Are you are you in a great place right now at this time in yeah. your life? Very very fortunate because uh, I was able to connect with my 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 spiritual teacher in '87. 
uh, was that moment in time where I was I was doing the Christmas album. I was fidgeting around with Big Generator, and then I met this little lady from Honolulu, the Divine Laura, who changed my life. Wow! And, uh, just woke me up because I've been trying to wake up for years, you know, and I'm. I woke up, and I'm still trying to wake up better, obviously, more every day. And what's the process for someone uh, being uh, woken up? Like, how many years did you go through, and, and what, were you, what were you studying? No, I think it was a question of uh, when I first started, yes. Uh, mm-hmm. I was reading a, a book by a lady called uh, Vera Stanley Alder. It's called The Finding of the Third Eye, and I never understood what the third eye really was, you know, and the book is a tiny little book and I, I read it and I, and that made me realize that we're all Christ consciousness and the, the people that were the great spiritual leaders of our Christ consciousness were Jesus, Mohammed, Krishna and uh, Buddha and the four risen masters. This is a very well known, um, fact of life uh, to a lot of people, not most people, but right. a lot of people, because I could never quite get into the, well, we're Christian and they don't, they're going to hell. If you're not Christian, you're going to hell. What a way of thinking. That's why th- this whole perception of who we truly are right. is unfolding in such a gigantic way, the help of the virus. And you know, the virus I, 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 I was watching a program. I put it on my website, uh, my Facebook. Uh, an incredible, interesting fact of the virus is that because of the deforestation that we've been talking about now for 30 years, yeah. made a movie about it, uh, nothing's changed. The deforestation is getting worse around the world. Now, what's happened is that deforestation brings animals and all sorts of animals, insects and so on, together that shouldn't really be together because they're running away from the fire and the destruction and they get together and they create viruses because they are not to be together. It's a very way, interesting way of yes. perception of that. And uh, this is the first time I'm hearing of that. And that does sound uh, very interesting and logical. Ooh, blew my mind. Yeah. And it's, uh, as I say, it's on my Facebook. Uh, it's my, my divine mother, Audrey now, when Divine Mother Flora went to the place we all eventually go to, um, the next lady who took over the mantle of spirituality is now the chair of the Parliament of Religions around the world. I, I met her uh, at the end of a guitar tour in, in L.A., <laughs> this lovely lady, and she said that she was Audrey Kitagawa, and I said, hi, how are you? And she said, Good to see you. And she could see me. She could actually see me because she was a highly spiritual lady. And she is. And she has been going around the world uh, connecting with different sort of uh, spiritual people, shall we call it, and bringing everybody together as a, a, a sort of spiritual umbrella to wake us all up. And that's, a, a, in fact, the song Awaken, the Yes song, was all about that. Here I am in, in, in that sort of garden of the future. Which Let me, is a, a very interesting place to be. When you, John, when you're in a band. I carried away there. No, it's good. When, you, when you're in a band, this is, this, this is a jumping off point for me. To, I just thought of this. Hmm. When you're in a band situation and you're writing songs and you want to bring your unique spirituality to a song, is the band open to that? Or are they like, oh, here comes John with his stuff? <laughs> I, that's that's half that's and half. okay half and half all right well but but eventually uh, you know chris was very spiritual even though he was a, he was definitely darth vader to my obi-wan kenobi <laughs> but but it, it was the yin and yang that could land, you yeah know? and he went through hell because he had a, a different perception of mm-hmm. w- what he's supposed to be a great musician one of the greatest bass players phenomenal singer songwriter 
a little bit out there. <laughs> it takes everybody, it takes all kinds to make it work. Absolutely. And uh, Steve became very hermit, hermit-like on tour. He could go off in his own car. He became sort of just, just very, get on stage and play, dance around, and then off he went. Like a, yeah, a loner. A yeah. <laughs> a loner. Whereas when we were together, you know, we were bonded, you know. Mm-hmm. But that's what happens to every band. You know, I was watching uh, a documentary about the Beatles and what they went through and how amazingly within the space of five years they were starting doing She Loves You, Please Please Me, and then the Ticket to Ride, and then all of a sudden Revolver, then other White Album, and the Abbey Road, and yeah. basically like, boom, like that. And you think, wow. And that's what we went through. I can't even consider it to be what the Beatles did because they touched zillions of people. But we went through that same process where we were very tight, very close, da 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 and we splintered and then we bounced back together again and we bounced back together and surviving for years and years. It's kind of extraordinary. And on that note, <laughs> good talking to you. We're signing off. Are you ready to go? Well, let me ask. to go home. You have to go home. Let me ask you a... Uh, can I ask you two more fan questions? Okay. From the listeners. This one comes from uh, Michael Bagford from Urbana, Ohio. He says, uh, I loved your appearance on the King Crimson track, Prince Rupert Awakes. How did that come together? And are you still on good terms with the band, even though Bruford left Yes to join them? Yeah, when when Bill left, it, it was a shock because I thought Close to the Edge was very important. And I thought, What's wrong with our band? He's leaving the band. How could this happen? And he's going to King Crimson. My God. But I got over that after, in, after 10 minutes. But it was a, bit <laughs> a tough 10 minutes. And then but, my... Uh, Prince Rupert. Sorry. Go ahead. No, please. Uh, yeah, I was happy to see Prince Rupert. Farewell. Wake your reasons all over. I sang it just the way Bob wanted me to, because I learned it from a demo and went in and started to sing it as I would sing. He said, no, no, John, could you sing it a little bit more like the demo, please? And I said, okay. (laughs) Okay, Bob. (laughs) Now, when I was at school, I'd get up to go early to school to sit on this bridge and watch the trains go by. And every Wednesday was a beautiful, beautiful green steam train called Prince Rupert. Wow. Interesting. I know. know. (laughs) Uh, And then here's another one. This comes from Paul Watson in Auckland, New Zealand. He says, are you close to releasing the sequel to your first solo album, Oleus of Sun Hillel? Now this guy, this guy's a big fan. Yeah. Uh, Elias. Elias. I'm sorry. That's okay. (laughs) Zamran is the son of Elias. He is the, coordinator of the light beings that create the ley lines around the planet in order to make the power spots that every great place is above. And that's the story. And it's taken me 15 years to figure it out. I've got about four hours of music to prove it. And about four different versions. And I'm slowly getting there like this. Slowly, Eventually, slowly, slowly, slowly. It'll come. All right. Well, John, the new album is 1000 Hands, Chapter One. Yes. yes. You sound great. You look you look fantastic, John. I don't know what you're doing to stay <laughs> looking. In love. You're in love. You're yeah. in love with I'm everything. In love with life and my wife and everything else. Well, that'll do my it. My grandchildren, my kids. And such John, a blessing. John, if there's, uh, we, we're going to, I'm going to attach a play out song to this episode. What song from yeah. the new album would you like people to hear? Come up. Come up. 1,000. Yeah. Okay. Thank start, you. Start with Bill, with, uh, but, uh, I said, I nearly said Bill Burford, with um, Chick Corea and Jean Luc Ponty and uh, the drums. Excellent. Well, con- continued success, Billy John. Billy Cobham. <laughs> there Sorry, you go. Billy Cobham. Uh, Billy Cobham. Uh, see, you got it. 
Uh, conti- yeah. Continued success with this new album. I look forward yes. to f- seeing shows when you come to Los Angeles, hopefully next yeah. year. Maybe, maybe I'll get to, maybe I'll get to meet you in person. That would be a thrill. Yeah. Appreciate it. Thank you. Take care, John. Thank you so much. Take care now. Bye-bye. Bye. All right. So that was John Anderson. Uh, apparently he was only going to do an hour, which is great because he's a legend, but I just want to throw out there that you can follow John on Twitter at the John Anderson. You can go to John's website, johnanderson.com. We are going to have four copies of the new CD to give away, uh, not this week, but next week, courtesy of Melissa at Blue Alon Records. I want to thank Ryan Romanesco at Jensen Communications for setting this up. I've been talking with Ryan for uh, over, uh, I don't know, almost a year about doing this. So uh, thank you, Ryan, for finally coming through. And you can follow us at Rock Solid Show. And you can go to Rock Solid Podcast at uh, dot com. And um, I had so many other questions to get to, but um, but I think we covered a lot of detail. And um, John was willing to talk about his uh, his career and not just focus on the new album, which I was uh, I was pleased about, but surprised. But uh, the new album is One Thousand Hands. It's fantastic. And here we go with the playout song that John suggested. This is Come Up. Thanks. <laughs> 